Each year, more than 7 million people from all over the world visit the Metropolitan Museum of Art, walking among some of the most important pieces that span history. This 2.2 million square feet space houses 17 curatorial departments and holds over 2 million works of art in its permanent collection. You can see more masterpieces within this one space in one visit than most people do in a lifetime. It is impossible to sum up the history, collections, and the legacy of the Met. But to help guide your trip, here are five pieces that might make you view the Met and its art in a new light. This is the Temple of Dender, one of the most beautiful and special rooms to experience on your visit. It was ordered to be built by Emperor Augustus, the Roman governor of Egypt, in 23 BC. And its construction lasted for a while, about 1300 years. During his reign, Augustus had many temples erected honoring Egyptian deities. This temple in particular was built to honor the goddess Isis, as well as Pedasi and Pihor, two heroic Nubian brothers turned demigods. Originally, the temple stood on a large sandstone platform above the Nile River. It was brought to the Met in 1965, when the area was flooded by a dam project. And so a campaign was launched to save the Nubian monuments of the region, one of which was this small temple. In order to be transported, it was disassembled brick by brick, numbered, and put back together at the Met. It's important to note that contrary to popular belief, Egyptian temples were not solely made to house images of mythological or religious figures. More often than not, they reflected an image of the natural world in addition to depictions of deities. Like here, the water running alongside the temple is meant to portray the Nile River. On the inner lining of the temple, there are carvings of papyrus and lotus plants that are growing from water. As we gaze upwards, we can see these two columns rising to the sky like stalks of papyrus with lotus blossoms bound around them. Above the gate and temple entrances, we can see images of the sun disk and the wings of Horus, a sky god who often takes the shape of a falcon. On the outside of the walls, we can see carved scenes that depict Augustus as a pharaoh wearing traditional regalia as he makes offerings to the gods who hold scepters and the Ankh, the symbol of life. The gods being Isis, Osiris, their son Horus, and the other deities who are identified by their crowns and the inscriptions beside their figures. Should we have had the chance to witness this temple in its original glory and outdoors, we would see how beautifully the glowing Egyptian sun would cast shadows onto these important figures. This painting is one of the most famous pieces of Neoclassicism, an 18th century art movement based on the ideals of Rome and ancient Greece. It depicts the story of the execution of the Greek philosopher Socrates, as told by Plato in his book Phaedo. The story goes like this. Socrates was sentenced to death for corrupting the youth of Athens. Yet knowing his life will soon end as he prepares to drink the poison hemlock, he doesn't renounce his beliefs. He dies willingly, surrounded by his disciples, and uses his death as his final lesson. The scene is set in a prison with Socrates placed at the center, sitting upright in a bed dressed in a white robe. Around him are twelve figures. At the foot of the bed sits Plato, an elderly man looking away in quiet contemplation. To the right sits Crito, listening intently to his teacher's last words, clasping at his thigh. On the stairs in the background, we can see Socrates' wife, Xanthippe, having been dismissed after saying her goodbyes to her husband. All of the figures display a range of emotional reactions, some even of grave distress. Yet Socrates remains calm. David uses a muted color palette of reds, blues, and yellows here to convey the quiet weight of this scene. He uses the crisp whites of Socrates and Plato's clothing to set them apart from the others around them. On the left, a ray of light is coming through, drawing our eyes to Socrates even more as it reflects off his fair skin. 
David is in complete control of this canvas and has taken some artistic license to convey his message more poignantly. Like here, Socrates would be 70 years old at the time of his death, but is depicted as a younger figure. Plato would also have been a young man at the time, but here, he is an old man. In the preliminary sketches of this painting, we can almost see inside Davi's creative mind. The lines seem very rushed, and in places reiterated and redrawn. He was making a lot of changes, and considering several options for each corner. If we compare the drawing to the painting, we can see David made some of these changes, the most significant of which is the placement of Socrates' hand. His hand no longer touches a cup of hemlock, but instead hovers over it. This small addition of empty space creates an intense scene, a choice, a moment, the only thing standing between his present and his fate. Looking at this painting, we can see that there aren't many ornamentations or frivolous items. What grabs our attention the strongest is a feeling, which goes to show David's incredible talent in conveying a story without anything to distract from it. As we move towards the American wing of the Met, you might recognize this painting by John Singer Sargent. The subject that is so beautifully depicted here is Virginie Amélie Avenue, a young American-born socialite and the wife of a French banker, Pierre Gautreau. In Parisian high society, she was known for her beauty. In fact, Sargent painted this portrait of her without being commissioned to, but rather because he wanted to use her allure to enhance his reputation. He once wrote to a friend, I have a great desire to paint her portrait and have reason to think she would allow it and is waiting for someone to propose this homage to her beauty. Here, she stands in an unconventional pose Sargent has placed her in. Her head is looking over her left shoulder, highlighting her sharp profile and accentuating her features. A pose of retreat and at the same time of power. Her right arm is twisting backwards to expose her shoulder as her hand rests lightly on the table. The composition is simple, consisting of only one subject and one item against a bare background. The focus is only and wholly on her. She wears a black gown with gold straps. Expensive and well-constructed, it falls perfectly onto her porcelain skin. Although this painting is loved today, Upon its exhibition at the Paris Salon of 1884, it received more ridicule than praise. This was due to the fact that at the time, the subject's pose was considered sexually suggestive. And in its original form, Sargent had one of the straps of her dress hanging off, which further scandalized the piece. Later, Sargent repainted this piece to what we see here today and changed its name. He kept it for 30 years and finally sold it to the Met in 1916, saying, I suppose it is the best thing I have done. This is one of the most recognizable images from the American Revolutionary War and is often displayed in history textbooks, stamps, and even currency. Measuring at 12 by 21 feet, it is the largest framed painting at the Met and takes up an entire wall. This piece is in a word monumental, both in its size and its patriotic spirit for its country. It depicts a life-size George Washington leading his soldiers across the half-frozen Delaware River. On the night of December 25th and 26th, they rode in a storm and launched a surprise attack on the Hessian forces, who were German soldiers serving in the British Army during the American Revolutionary War. In the boat, we see 11 men surrounding Washington. These two were his officers, distinguished by their blue coats, and the rest, members of the public of all backgrounds. We can see a man in a Scottish bonnet, another of African descent, a man in traditional indigenous clothing, and two farmers. This event was a turning point in the war and a crucial military and moral win for Washington's underfunded army. After a period of defeat, on this Christmas night, there was finally hope. Here, the artist has chosen to prioritize the power of this scene through his choices that are at times not historically accurate. For example, the Stars and Stripes flag shown here 
was not actually used until nine months after this event. And although we can see the morning sun rising, the event actually took place in the middle of the night. Due to its subject matter, it's surprising to note that the artist Emanuel Leutze is actually German and painted this piece in Dusseldorf in 1850. It was exhibited in New York in October of 1851 and immediately became the topic of conversation. Over the next four months, more than 50,000 people bought tickets to see it in person. What makes this painting special is the element of diversity. That's the key takeaway. America is an immigrant country. It was in the 1700s, and it still is today. And that is something worth depicting and remembering. This enormous 700 years old mural is the museum's largest unframed piece. It was painted in the year 1319 during China's Yuan Dynasty and was originally at the Guangsheng Buddhist Temple. As is true with many pieces of this time period, the artist is unknown. However, there are certain similarities between this piece and the works of Shu Haogu. Look at these two pieces. Both images contain powerful, full-face figures placed prominently in the forefront in elaborate Chinese clothing. Here, we see Bai Shajia Guru, the Buddha of medicine dressed in a red robe. During this time period, physical and spiritual healing practices played an important role in conveying messages of Buddhism throughout Asia. Surrounding our central figure are 18 subjects, six of which are bodhisattvas. These figures are highly enlightened beings who have vowed to help all sentient creatures find release from samsara, the endless cycle of rebirth. Between these elaborately dressed figures and the more modest Buddha are two small circles. One is red and the other is white. These are the symbols for the sun and the moon, conveying the message that the Buddha of medicine works day and night to help people. Further out, we can see 12 warriors, six on each side of the canvas which reinforces the message of the Buddha's vow to help others. Though quite populated, the figures, offerings, flowers, and items are delicately outlined as to articulate each corner of this piece. At its conception, the colors we see here would have been much more vibrant, and this piece would be sitting amongst other instructive murals high up on the walls of the monastery. The Metropolitan Museum of Art is one of the finest and most beloved museums in the world. Each room holds some of the most important artworks throughout history, spanning 5,000 years of world culture, from prehistoric times to the present, and from every corner of the world. So remember to enjoy yourself, make your own connections, and know that the purpose of art is to provoke thought rather than to intimidate. So let in the history that surrounds you. I hope you enjoyed the video and thank you for liking and subscribing if you already have.